Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Malcolm. I'm the Associate Leader at Restore Loughton, and I'm really pleased to be coming and sharing with you this morning. So we, as a church, have been working through the book of Exodus, and we are at the point where, ex where the Israelites find themselves in the wilderness, um, at Exodus chapter si uh, 16. So I'll, I'll read from that in a moment. Let's just, let's just pray before I start. Father God, thank you so much for what you are doing right now um, in your church. Thank you for, for the way that you are uh, speaking into your bride, the church. And Jesus, we just want to come before you uh, today and we want to ask, Lord, that you would speak deep into the heart of who we are and that you would continue to mould us and shape us into who you need us to be and who you want us to be. And uh, yeah, we thank you for this time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Exodus 16. The whole community of Israel set out from Elim and journeyed into the wilderness of Sin between Elim and Mount Sinai. They arrived there on the 15th day of the second month one month after leaving the land of Egypt. There too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. Wow, okay. We're going to come back to, we're going to, come back to this passage um, but before we do, let's just have a little uh, focus on, on this word, the wilderness. Let's start with a couple of jokes, shall we? So, so first of all, um, if you get lost in a Canadian wilderness, don't panic unless you see at least one grizzly stalking you. That's the bare minimum. Yeah? Should, should go on to the next one. So these are some comments left um, on forest service registration sh uh, sheets and comment cards by backpackers completing wilderness camping trips. Too many bugs and leeches and spiders and spiders webs. Please spray the wilderness to rid the area of these pests. The coyotes made too much noise last night and kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. Trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. Too many rocks in the mountains. Here's a simple trick to follow. Last one. If you're caught in the wilderness without any toilet paper, just take a leaf out of Bear Grylls' book. There we go. This is quite hard. Like, where's the, have we got any canned laughter that we can, you know, just encourage me with these jokes, please? Um, <laughs> that's, that's it. I'm not doing any more. Okay, wilderness, the wilderness. What, what does the word wilderness bring to mind? Maybe, maybe you've got a negative image of that word wilderness. Maybe it conjures up images of, of silence, of trials, of confusion and frustration, hardship and toil or, or temptation. It's things that don't sound so appealing. Or, or maybe not. Maybe, maybe you, you love a wilderness adventure holiday. There's lots of those advertised, aren't there, these days. Maybe you, you, you relish the idea of having been in a place where you've got breathing space, where there's that peace, intimacy away from everything, the adventure, um, exciting dangers, and that ability to retreat away from the noise. The Bible says a lot about wilderness. It's quite a big theme um, throughout the Bible. So we're going to have a little look uh, just before we go back to our Exodus passage, of some of the other um, major things the Bible speaks to us about wilderness. So, there's often reference to the fact that sometimes we find ourselves in the wilderness aimlessly wandering. And there's that sense, how on earth did I get here? This wasn't supposed to happen. In Genesis um, at chapter 21, we, we hear about Hagar and Ishmael being sent away by uh, Abraham into the wilderness where they wandered aimlessly. And things got so bad for Hagar and Ishmael that, that Hagar was sure that Ishmael was, was about to die and she, she couldn't bear to watch him die and she left him in, under a tree 
and, and went and sat um, somewhere else. But the, the reality was that, that God heard the cries of Ishmael and he came and he rescued. Similarly to, to how we've been hearing God hearing the cries of the Israelites when they were in Egypt. He heard their cries and he's a God who rescues. Um, sometimes we just don't know how we end up in a situation. Sometimes we feel lost, we feel helpless. I don't know whether you've had times in your life like that. Maybe you're in a time like that at the moment. Over the last few weeks, um, we've, one of the themes that we've, we've come back to as we've been looking at the Israelites and their, and their reality that they're faced with is, is this sense of it's actually okay to groan. And, and God hears our cries. God hears our groaning. The wilderness can feel like a really tough place and it can feel like sometimes it's out of control and, and, and that God has gone quiet, that we've lost control. But we've learned that even though we sometimes can't control what happens in the wilderness, we can control our response. It's okay to groan. It's okay to cry out to God. And sometimes that's all we can do particularly when we find ourselves in this place of confusion, learning to groan, not moan. We saw as well, didn't we? we saw as well how long the Israelites had to endure the wilderness, partly due to the fact that they were moaning in the wilderness. And we see that in the passage that we've just read. The next, so if, if we, we, we see the Bible refer to aimless wandering in the wilderness, we also see that um, there's, a, there's a reality to the deep wilderness. Okay, and, and you know, we see that, that actually in the deep wilderness, we encounter God. Moses, as we were hearing a couple of weeks ago, meets God face to face. He meets God face to face and he learns from God that he wants, he wants Moses to know him by name. He, he says, I am. I am the unchanging one. I am Yahweh. And in Moses' confusion, he finds out first who God is, finds out God's name. And it's through him finding out who God, who God is that he finds out who he is himself. That personal encounter with God deep in the wilderness. Another place in the Bible where we see that deep wilderness experience is with John the Baptist. We hear in, uh, the, in John chapter 3, uh, or sorry, in Luke chapter 3, John is living in the wilderness. And a, a message from God came to him whilst he's living in the wilderness. And a voice of one calling out in the wilderness, make straight paths for the Lord. That, that sense of, God wants to speak to us deep things when we're in that wilderness place. And of course, Jesus was compelled to go into the wilderness, wasn't he? He was baptised, had that incredible encounter with, with the Father, and he's compelled to go into the wilderness. The Spirit compels him, the Bible tells us, to go into the wilderness. And deep in the wilderness, Jesus has another encounter, the enemy. And the reality is that sometimes deep in the wilderness, the enemy wants to derail us. The enemy was desperate to derail Jesus and brought temptation after temptation after temptation to Jesus. Jesus knew how to deal with the enemy. And we need to learn to be like Jesus, don't we? When we're particularly in these deep experiences of wilderness. From personal experience, I've I've experienced the enemy trying to derail, derail me, and I'll maybe refer to a little bit of, of that later. But the reality is Jesus responded to the enemy with the truth. If we respond to the enemy with the truth, he can't stand. He's got, no, he's got nothing to come back at us with. And Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. 
So that's the second part of uh, the wilderness experience in the Bible. The third thing I want to mention is the reality of, a, of an intentional wilderness. We hear, don't we, about how Jesus only did what the Father said. It tells us that in John 5, verse 16. And in Luke chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness to pray. Time alone with the Father, in the secret place, away from distraction. I encourage you, find the secret places where you can be alone with God, where you can retreat into the wilderness. You know, th throw the phone in the, in the bin for a couple of days. Get rid of the distractions and just find that time to retreat and be in that place where it's just you and God. It's great to be together, isn't it? But also we need that time where we can just have that intentional wilderness where we can really hear what God is saying so that we can be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want to just do what God says. So forge a way into the wilderness. Find solitude. Find that secret place for you and God to meet, away from the noise and away from the distractions. Find those, those, those high places. Jesus often retreated and went up the, the Mount of Olives, the high place. Um, and and I, that's a, a great place, isn't it? Where you can really gain perspective in those, in those high places. Over these last few years, we've had a, an amazing gift of a number of families um, but Tobias and Joyce and the girls have been a real gift to us over these last few years. And as we send them off to America in a couple of months, um, I've been reflecting on, 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 the, on what they've brought to us um, as Restore and as God's people here in this place. And I think one of the things that they've, they've left as a legacy, that they're going to be leaving as a legacy, is their commitment to finding that space to be with God. Tobias often finds, finds time to just pray through the night. And it's, a, it's something that he's done regularly. And I've been inspired by that. And I found myself waking up in the night recently and just, just getting away into, into the quiet, dark places of the night where I can just be with God. It's a very different place. The world is in the dead of night. We see things we don't normally see in the day when no one is around, when the distractions are gone. Find that wilderness space. Forge your way into the wilderness. Retreat often. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Let's be a people who are seeking God with all of our hearts. And so we come to our passage. The Israelites find themselves in this wilderness, this in-between place. Sometimes it's referred to as the, the liminal space, the place a person is in during a, a transitional period. Almost like, a, like the departure lounge that you find yourself in when you're going on a journey somewhere to, to a, a place that you're, that you're maybe hopefully excited about going to. It's a place of waiting. And uh, we've all been there, or maybe we've not all been there, we've maybe all been in that place where we're in that um, airport lounge. And, and, maybe, and maybe we... We've had our flight delayed and you can feel the frustration rising and it kind of gives you an idea of, of where the Israelites are as they, as they respond to the fact that they've, they've come from one place which was all right actually. They were, they were okay, they were fed and they were, they were, they were able to eat onions. I don't, I don't know why they... Yeah, they, they refer to onions being as, as something that they, they, they had plenty of. But, the, but there's, 
this reality that why did we, why did we ever leave? Maybe you found yourself in that position as well in, in the past. Why on earth have I stepped out into this? I should have just stayed where I was. A bit like being in that airport lounge and the temptation is to go to the airport staff and grumble and complain. Like the Israelites went and grumbled and complained to Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. Wow. Okay, so... This place, this in-between place, between the promise given and the fulfilment, from Egypt to Canaan, this place in between provides a place of testing and training. There's that sense, isn't there, of why do we, why do we have to go through this? Can't we just go from Egypt to Canaan? Do we really have to experience this, this time of testing and training. just want to share with you a little bit of, of my story, of our story as a family. Um, as a teenager, I, I had a strong call to a particular nation. The nation was Brazil. It almost became like my promised land, like the place that I felt God had called me to and I, the sense that I was going to live there and spend my, my days in Brazil. I met my now wife, Emily, and she'd also had this conviction about the, the country of Brazil. To cut a long, long story short, we, we got married, we had a couple of kids, um, and we, we started to pick up this calling that God had put on our lives to this country called Brazil. The clarifying of that call seemed to take a long time. It seemed to be a, a wilderness in itself for us actually getting to Brazil. But finally in, in 2010, we packed up home and set off for six months to Brazil um, to see if we could find a place God wanted us uh, to, to serve in that nation. So this time, 14 years ago, we were living in a place called Picos in a province of Piauí, the hottest province in Brazil. It was hot. Lucy, our eldest, was four and Albert, um, had just turned three. It was tough. You know, we'd, with, with young children, we were sleeping on, on church floors and it, and it felt like it was a, a challenging experience. Our hearts then and our hearts now were children on the margins, children at risk. And during our time there, we were exposed to working with children, um, girls in particular, who lived on the streets in um, the towns that we were, were serving. And they lived as prostitutes. Our hearts broke. How could it be that girls as young as eight could be living as prostitutes on the streets? So at the end of our six month stay, we were invited to come back and, and run a rescue centre in the middle of the town of Recife. And it felt like, well, of course that's what we'll do. It felt like God had opened, opened up this door um, to this, this place called Hope House. Um, and it, and, it, and when we, we said, yeah, we'd love to, to partner in doing that. And we left Brazil that, uh, six months later with, with this plan to return a year later. A few months being back in the UK, it became clear that it wasn't going to be possible to go back in a year for various reasons. And it was probably one of the most difficult periods of our lives. This promise of this calling seemed to have just been pulled out from underneath our feet. The enemy significantly went on the offensive just like he did with Jesus. We had a, a car accident which ended up costing us £20,000 because we'd forgotten to put my name back on the insurance when we came back from Brazil. We had countless things to deal with and battle through. Culture shock, reverse culture shock of our kids as well as us. The guilt and the shame that we felt that the enemy was trying to 
convince us about, trying to convince us that we were inadequate, trying to convince us that we didn't measure up. But during that time, we felt that God say, wait five years. And I was like, oh, really? I didn't want to wait five years. But looking back, I can see that it was necessary. God did some amazingly significant things in our lives during that period. And during the period that we were in Brazil for that six months, which have shaped and moulded who we are today. And then, four years into the waiting five years, God did an amazing thing. It was an amazing, beautiful surprise. Out of nowhere, we'd never, had a, we'd never felt called really to Africa at all. We'd never really had a desire to go to Africa, but it seemed out of, out of nowhere, God said, I want you to go to Zambia. And so from the, from the moment of him saying uh, this to the, to the reality of us ending up in Zambia, it was literally from the February and then in the August we were there. It was incredible. And it was, it was like it was a pure gift from God. And, and a real place of, of healing, of restoration, and almost, almost retreat, where God could, could heal what, what we felt so broken about. We felt that we'd been called as missionaries. We spent four years in Zambia, and it was an amazing time for us as a family. And so here we are, 14 years later, after we first went to Brazil. We've still never been back to Brazil. And I don't know, we don't know how that Brazil part of our story will end. But we do know that God has spoken very clear things to us and shaped us in very real ways. Um, and one of the clear things that he said to us throughout our time, throughout our wilderness time, was... You won't go back and care for broken children. In this land of Brazil. Until you've learned how to care for broken children in your homeland. And so that's what we've been compelled to do as we're back in our homeland right now. We're not going anywhere just now. So we still hold on to the promise that God made about us being sent and we're pretty sure he will send us off again one day. But at the moment we know that right here, for us, Loughton is where God has called us. And so we're coming towards the, the end of what I want to share this morning. I've mentioned a few different things about the encounter of God that, that, we, that we have with God in the wilderness. That sense that, is, that, that we can, we, we're able to have a deep encounter where the deep things of us cry out to the deep things of God in the wilderness. I want to encourage you to be led by the Spirit into the wilderness and be intentional about finding that place where you can retreat into the wilderness. Maybe find some high places that you can go to. And when you find yourself in that place, in that liminal space, where you think, I just don't know how I got here. Remember, it's okay just to groan. It's okay to cry out to God. And maybe that's what you need to do this morning as you're listening to this. Maybe you're in that place right now. And I want to stand with you. As maybe you've listened to my story, I'm sure you've got your own story. And let's cry out to God for together. Let's groan before God and ask God to meet us where we're at in our different circumstances. 
We're here together as church. And if you need one of us to come round to your home and stand and pray with you through your circumstances, please make sure you get in touch. One of us as, as leaders with your home group leader, send us an email. We want to be standing together because remember, we're not supposed to do this on our own. Never meant to do it on our own. We're in this together. God will not leave you and he will provide just what you need. We've not had a chance even to touch on the provision of the manna and the water from the rock that God provided the Israelites. But he will, he's promised. He will never let you be tested beyond what you can cope with and he will give you everything that you need. So as I finish... Why don't we just pray together? Father God, I want to thank you that you will never leave us. You are in every circumstance. You can bring and you will bring good out of every circumstance. And Lord, for those who are going through a period and a time of wilderness, those people who are just um, thinking, I just don't know how I got here. This was never supposed to happen. My life was never supposed to be like this. It's not how I imagined it. Lord, would you come and draw near? Would you come close? Would Would deep cry out to deep? Thank you that you provide everything that we need. And we put our circumstances, our situations and our lives in your hands. In Jesus' name. Amen.